Is there really a deadlock in nominating new bishops and what the House of Bishops doing about that? Raise in the nays again and are celebrities now professing Jesus more? <laughs> Hi, welcome to the channel. My name is Rodan. I'm a vicar in the Church of England. On this channel, you get my views as a parish priest on all the Christian news happening in the world today. Subscribe to the channel, like the video, comment down below, share it, and don't forget to hit that notification bell. Also, subscribe to my Substack where I'm creating a community up there. You can scan the QR code here or click the link down below. So, Again, this is Rev Dan's Roundup. Lots of stories go through. No big, big, big stories this week, potentially, because there is one thing that we're going to kick off with about the House of Bishops. So the House of Bishops, well, a few bishops in the House of Bishops have uh, submitted a paper. They have a meeting uh, coming up where they're saying look, that the, pro the process for nominating new bishops isn't working even though they just changed it in 2021. We're going to get into this article from the Church Times where they say, after deadlocks, the Crown Nominations Commission secret ballots may end. So the Crown Nominations Commission, or CNC for short, nominate bishops. And for the last six vacancies, two haven't, been, uh, haven't gone through. And so this is a big problem, apparently. Uh, so that's the third, haven't gone through. Uh, previously... In previous years, for many years, uh, before that, in the 15 years to the end of 2022, the article says, the CNC failed to appoint just twice in 55 processes. So, well, <laughs> you know, is that a problem? Twice in 55 processes. So some bishops uh, have come and said, look, there's the, the stuff going on. And, and let's point out straight away, is this a... Uh, an effect of LLF. Of course it is, really. Because now the, the Church of England is divided between those who hold to a traditional view of marriage and those who hold to a liberal view of marriage or, or, or same-sex blessings. And um, if you're going to get a new bishop, you, you want, each side will want a bishop who will be supportive of whichever side perhaps the diocese one or, or, or who's on the nomination committee. This is, this is, this is what more than likely what is happening because with the process being changed back in 2021 we're only in 2024 now there's only been six processes part of the problem that they have is if a bishop isn't nominated and they're put in the the, the whole process the interview stage and all those things that they go through are put into the current calendars of all those people uh, many months even years ahead if there's no one nominated they have to wait until their next slot and and so a couple of the dioceses who didn't get bishops, I think one's, you know, will be waiting nearly two years for a diocesan bishop. So, or diocesan, or however I say it, I always say it wrong. Always do. Um, so, so yes, that's a problem, not having a, a bishop leading. But, um, so, some of the bishops have come to the House of Bishops and said, look, this needs changing. Is it good? Mm, it doesn't read good. It doesn't read well. Especially uh, at the end of this article. In February, the Archbishop of Canterbury told General Synod that the CNC had been comprehensively reviewed in the previous quinquennium of the General Synod, because it, meet, it gets elected every five years, and that there was no further formal review planned. So, you know, comprehensively reviewed uh, by General Synod, and there was no formal review planned. Okay, so there's not saying changes, but there was, it wasn't on the horizon, but it is. Uh, and they want to open up the process. Um, at the moment, uh, some of the changes are saying when the CNC panels uh, come together and they come in pairs of twos um, onto that panel, and I think there might be 12 or 15 or something like that, um, with, with the other people like the archbishops there, or an archbishop, they vote. And that vote is secret. It's a secret ballot. And so nobody knows what, what's been done. Uh, but now they're saying we want it to be open so people can be accountable for the other, um, to the other uh, people on the panel, so they know how you vote. You know, there was a reason why it's always been secret. It's been secret for the previous uh, 
oh, well, up until now it's been secret. And so now to open it, that's going to be really challenging for those people who are voting. Other people will now know. And so um, that's one of the proposals. The other proposal is taking the, the voting uh, and it's from, I think at the moment it's uh, it says here that take the voting threshold for, to get the new person in from at least two thirds. So it was 14 members on the CNC and they had to get 10 voting for the bishop to be uh, appointed. And now they want to take that from two thirds uh, to at least 60 percent. So nine uh, members. Uh, so, and if there were any abstentions, were no longer counted towards the threshold, uh, and an agreement of at least half the members would be required. So, um, they're, they're trying to lower the threshold as well. So, they're opening up the process so you can't do secret ballots. They want to lower the threshold. Uh, I suppose what they're trying to do is to avoid tactical voting. And so, in a sense, in, in doing this, they're admitting that there is tactical voting, and I'm sure. <laughs> throughout the whole process, even before LLF, there was tactical voting for bishops. Um, and, and another proposal would give the archbishop chairing the commission uh, for a particular C, and that's what they call it, for the, the, the vacancy, a C, or, 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 or the, the position, one extra casting vote. Should the CNC reach a point that it was unable to secure a nomination? So if they weren't able to secure the nomination, then the archbishop could... Um, put an extra vote and so remember they voted already and this in one way or another happens like for example in our PCC meetings at local churches the chair in the point of a, a vote being taken and it's equal numbers uh, has the casting vote but is that right here that's the question um, we, we now know that both archbishops are, are voted for LLF um, Archbishop Justin Welby now is abstaining from the votes, but we know his voting record from February last year that he voted for this and he wants these changes. So you, so if we are talking about this as a division between traditional and liberal, you know, we now got two archbishops who uh, have a cast of vote, not saying that they're going to um, put their theology on this. I'm sure they want the best person. But if this is all about this, that question has to be asked as well it, it, you know shouldn't be shouldn't one the arch, one of the archbishops be uh, um, a traditional on uh, LLF and, and marriage um, and safe sex blessings and all those things and so that could be the question that coming up for when the archbishop retires and they go to appoint a new archbishop if we've got a liberal archbishop in York we should have a traditional archbishop in Canterbury and then to counteract both archbishops should be because it reads from this um that there's one archbishop but both archbishops should be on on that on that in that meeting and both get casting voters aware they would cancel each other out anyway you know what i mean it's um it's a it's a huge change and they're going to bring this so they're going to take it to the house of bishops meeting next week and then they're going to bring this to general synod uh next year in february 2025 to to vote on now talk online is uh especially uh, from evangelicals is this this should not pass this is not a good thing uh, even words like it's a power grab um and and, and you could see it, it does seem like you're making it easier uh, for these things uh, to happen you're giving an archbishop a casting vote you're, you're now forcing people in a secret ballot and how it's always been a secret ballot to now open up and face scrutiny uh, and, and that's pressure, isn't it? You can imagine the pressure of that. And um, and it, they're saying just, no, it, it, it's not right. And especially as it has just been changed. So the, the powering of people, those are the changes that went through General Synod and were agreed uh, that this is the right way to go in the last review. So maybe the Archbishop of Canterbury is right, but it, what would be interesting to hear out in the world and, and, and the House of Bishops are saying look we're, we're going to be more transparent now is which bishops have uh, come to ask for this to be spoken about at the House of Bishops and for that to be taken to General Synod uh, you know and it could be all traditional viewed bishops or it could be all liberal viewed bishops or it could be a mixture of both and saying this process isn't working and actually we really are concerned about uh, not having diocesan bishops in place um, but like I said uh, just a minute ago 
out of 55 nominations, two didn't get through. And, um, you know, that's that's a high, you're just waving them through. Is, that, is there a, a robust process or is, is the person that's put forward or one of the, the number of people are just so good? You will always, um, even in local parishes, even if you get four people interviewed, you might not offer them the job because you just don't feel after discernment, and this is all about discernment, that they are right for the role. So we will wait to see again what happens. It doesn't look good. It, it does feel a bit like, um, well, you, you can't say because you don't know where this is coming from. But online uh, and the forums and, and, and people who are speaking about this, it doesn't feel right. And, and hopefully General Synod will see it, that it is not voted through and that the current process continues. What they probably need to do is more is review how they um, do the interviews and, and so the time between uh, an unsuccessful appointment and the next interview date is, is shortened um, and, and, make the, the, and let the process that has been uh, established in, I think, 2021 continue. And if only a third get through, then maybe maybe that's a good thing. It might be that these people who went forward were just not right. But it also could be that they're blocking liberal or traditional bishops from becoming the diocesan bishop because that's the consequence of LOF. That's just what happens. But also moving on, um, and, and this is a good thing, it seems, a, a new chair has been appointed for the National Safeguarding Panel. And so we all know, and it continues, and I even reported on something last week which is involving a, a priest from the safeguard, uh, with the safeguarding concerns. But with all the stories coming out in Church of England about safeguarding, it needs to be sorted out. And, and, and you know one thing, uh, traditional voices and liberal voices are calling for this as well. This is one thing that is uh, united us. The safeguarding in the Church of England needs to be sorted out. And what happened last year at General Synod and, all the, and the sucking of the independent safety panel uh, safeguarding panel is, is you know, everybody was just shocked by that. But um, now a, a guy called Nazir Afal, uh, who's a lawyer and he was known for prosecuting the Rochdale grooming gangs, has been appointed as the next independent chair of the National Safeguarding Panel, NSP. Um, and the NSP was set up in 2014 to scrutinise the Church of England safeguarding. But obviously it's, it's not been working well as uh, as many of my videos have said and it's been out into the national press as well which is never good and even in my last video i said the bbc did a an in-depth uh, report on this on their website um but he has worked in the catholic church for the catholic safeguard and standards agency he uh, has been uh, the Pran Pran uh, crown prosecution service for uh, almost a decade um welsh government chief executive of the association of Association of Police and Crime Commissioners. So I, I think this man will bring a robustness and um, to the role, and and, and he, he, he sounds like a, you know he's done a lot and he's worked with a lot of different places and the church. He's a practicing Muslim, but he he, he understands the church, uh, and and this isn't about religion here. This is about getting the right person in to sort out safeguarding. And he says, I am pleased to take on this important role to lead and continue work on scrutiny and providing challenge to the Church of England's safeguards and governance, particularly its policy and guidance. Um, and he's had a 30 year career. So have uh, the Church of England finally got the right person? And going back to last year, is he going to be truly independent? And this is the big thing. or Because uh, that's the only way this is going to work. If he can be truly independent, and, and, and look at what's been happening in the Church of England and look at where we currently are. If he's not independent, again, it, it will fall down like it did last year with the, in the, uh, the ISP, um, where they truly didn't seem that they were independent. And, and, and hopefully, um, this is what we're going to see. The, the Bishop of Stepney, uh, Dr. Joanne Grenfell, said, as we continue to work out details around wider independence, following the General Synod vote in July, the work of the NSP will ensure our work is how to account, and I look forward to working with Nasir as the DC NSP. So that's the other thing, that the General Synod, in response to what happened, voted about for the independent uh, safeguarding. So we will wait and see, and hopefully there'll be just, the safeguarding will be a lot stronger, all the past 
things that happen will be sorted out and we can move forward as a church knowing that we are stopping these people coming in who, who only really come in because it was an avenue to abuse uh, people and especially young children was absolutely wrong but the church really hasn't got it right uh, in sorting all that out so moving from that to um, cathedrals again um, raves in the nave uh, from the telegraph Ibiza thing gig in Peterborough Cathedral triggers criticism and so we're kind of getting used to this a lot of cathedrals are doing this or doing yoga or, and, and silent discos and all these things in cathedrals we're getting used to it that you know they say look we need money we need money we need money they they, they don't get any money from the church of england they do run themselves but remember as i said in my last video as well they do charge for people to get in which i i, I just totally disagree with but here's the criticism all souls day party pl uh, plan promotes one vicar to say the church of england cathedrals have lost confidence in their core mission they're doing it on all souls day and all souls day is the day that we remember those who have died uh, and loved ones in in, in my church uh, we'll have an all souls day service and we'll look back uh, over the past few years people who we've taken funerals for and we will write to them and invite them to a service to remember their loved one and it's a beautiful service because you get uh, these family and friends coming collectively in their grief for their loss but you know they're all they're all together and we we read out the names and we remember them and and it's part of the the healing process the mourning process the, the grief process and um but the <laughs> i cannot believe i'm not like high church here and listen people will say that's a bit high church sometimes um calling it all souls uh, a lot of people will call it something different but to hold it on this day this day is a cathedral as well um uh, where's the thinking where's the thinking in this so uh the tickets 39 pounds 39 pounds uh and it's on the 2nd of november and it promises a night of ibiza classics so think about this uh you know i grew up with loads i never went to ibiza myself at that point um where and it kind of still is known for its raves and its parties and its sex and its drugs and its drinking and the fights and all that but um, think about that. A night of Ibiza Castles. What, what 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 does that bring into your mind? And then it's in a cathedral, and um, it's the place where King Henry the uh, first wife Catherine the Arrogant is buried. I'm sure he wouldn't be too pleased about it as well. And um, we we continue to see this. Peterborough Cathedral said, "Look, we're, we're self-funding here. We, we don't get any money from the Church of England, and we and and they said there was no choice but to use the building for non-religious use. And you, some churches have to use their buildings, and they do use for their buildings for non-religious use. And so fine that 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 happens. But what what is permitted? Um, they say our electricity bill has gone up 120,000 pounds this year. If we don't do other things, we won't be able to survive." Um, and but this is the interesting thing that they say here. Mr. Stainton added that secular concerts such as the Ibiza Classics could attract new people to the church. How? And they could. I, w I wouldn't deny. Uh, it could. It could. Yeah. Um, but is the gospel being preached? Is, you know, are, are you engaging, speaking to people? Are you? Are you is there are there any vicars there anything on that night you know to speak to people about the christian faith or is it you just open the doors people go and spend 39 kid quid do ibiza classics and then they're going to come to church on sunday it, like i say it could happen i don't think it might but um they say we have used the key cathedrals uh, as intended to be used which is a place of worship but also a place of coming together and joy uh, but uh, and i like this bit in the in the paper cathedral peterborough's cathedral account showed it ended the financial year 2021 to 2022 with a surplus of 190,152 pounds and yes that was a couple of years ago but um you know they are making money a lot more money than my church makes <laughs> so um but if it's uh you know the key cathedral is the spiritual home for each diocese right and so that's where everything you kind of say radiates from it in one way 
they are an important place. And um, when cathedrals do this, it, 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 as clergy and even laity, you can look at your cathedral and, and, and really see, is this, is this really my home, in a sense, in, in the diocese? So um, Dan, Daniel French, uh, French of uh, Irreverent Podcast says, uh, this is not like a Handel concert with cheese and wine at the interval. Uh, I'm not trying to be a snob, but there, but there you would have the aesthetic. Whereas Ibiza night is going to be pumping out a message of hyper-individualism and sexual license. That doesn't feel quite right. Uh, and, and absolutely. He goes on to say, I would be cynical about clergy saying that this is getting people into the church. I don't believe it is a coherent form of evangelism. A lot of young people, are adult, a lot of young adults I am meeting are asking for faith that is demanding and in many ways more traditional. I can't imagine this happening in a mosque. And he's absolutely right that the young people that are coming to church at the moment want traditional services and they want a, a certainty of faith and they're asking for that. And so putting these on and, and again, you have to question what songs are going to be played. Are they going to go through the playlist and, and, and tell them you can't play that song, that there's hugely sexual references in here? And, you know, and how, you know, I remember going to clubs and you see people dance. How, I know most people would be older. <laughs> and the thing is, if it's like the uh, classics, you might be getting all the older people going rather than the young people. But, you know, how are you allowing people to dance? Are you allow people to grind with each other or, or what? So... There are other ways to raise money, and I don't think uh, this will either get people into the cathedral the next day or, or, or really preach the gospel a bit there. But uh, I, I, yeah, well, let's move on. Some good news. Thousands attend March for Life in London. So this happened on Saturday, and I really wanted to go, and I, I, and I just couldn't get down there, but I was really intending to go, but uh, maybe I'll make it next year. Uh, thousands of people gathered in central London last Saturday to take part in the March for Life, uh, Christian today tells us. Uh, and they marched from the Emanuel Centre, where they were ha ha having talks and seminars, to Parliament Square. And um, this year's theme was abortion isn't health care. And, and this is really important, you know, to stand in for, from back and not being there. This word uh, that they use in health care, how can... You say abortion is health care when a, a, a baby dies. It's, it's, <laughs> you're not caring for the health of that baby. You're terminating the life. And what's beautiful about s s things like the March for Life is you've got Protestants, you've got Catholics, you've got Orthodox, you've got all the, uh, the, the different traditions coming together and saying that uh, abortion is wrong. Both lives matter. And, and uh, when the, the chance that was coming from the stage was pro-life, that's a lie, babies never choose to die. And so, um, and I think that's from a, a guy who actually used to do abortions himself. Um, he uh, got up and spoke on st stage. He's a retired family physician who's practiced medicine for 40 years. I know that what real healthcare is, and I assure you abortion, the killing of our children is not healthcare. Um, so that was a guy called Hayward who was chanted from the... Um, the stage so the, the, uh, this is really good it never will get on uh, into mainstream even though there'll be thousands and thousands there uh, but it's it, it's highlighting this and it's highlighting the Christian stats and there'll be many non-Christians there as well and uh, perhaps other religions as well because this this is important but it's great that so many Christians can come together but it's also uh, not just this day but we we speak about this and it's important that we speak about this um, to people and in our churches uh, because if we stand on the teachings of God and there's no way, uh, there's, uh, and I, I know Christians have tried to justify abortion, uh, that I can see this. And, and, and as I said um, in a video, I don't know when, um, the Catholics really lead on this as well. The Catholics really lead on this. And it'd be great to start seeing some uh, archbishops and bishops in the Church of England standing up for this and actually being out on the streets uh, next September, uh, marching in solidarity that abortion is not health care. We will wait and see. We will wait and see. We moved to South America. I t said I talk about Christian news and uh, the story comes out of South America that the Episcopal Diocese of Nicaragua uh, has its assets seized 
by uh, San Sandanista, uh, the president's government, and, and he's doing this in Nicaragua. This comes from Anglican Inc. Um, closing down churches, closing down secular organisations as well, um, and this is like closing like the Church of England down. This is like closing the Church of England down and taking all of its assets. This, this is how huge this is, and and it. It's unbelievable, and it's a persecution of Christians, and, and and this is absolutely wrong. And I think the Russians are doing this in uh, uh, Russia with evangelical churches, and in, in the parts of Ukraine that they have occupied, they're closing down evangelical churches and churches as well. And and, and this is the persecution of Christianity is uh, rife, uh, but this is do being done at government level as well. So the article says on the twentieth of August, twenty twenty four, the Ministry of the Interior. Uh, published the names of 92 churches and religious groups and then 77 civil organisations cancelling their legal charters. Um, and so it says there were 1,651 civil society organisations last month uh, that were cancelled. And it brings the total number of organisations since 2018 of 5,552 cancelled by the government and this is is it's hugely wrong because um, where did yeah listen to this the government the latest move by the government led by President Daniel Ortega and his wife and Vice President uh, Rosario Murillo um, what's his wife uh, doing in this I I would have to look to see if she's elected but wow you know what's going on there and it says um, the Episcopal Church has. Uh, had its roots uh, in mission work begun in, on the Atlantic coast in 1742 when the area was a British uh, protectorate. And so in the early 19th century, pla planters imported slaves from Jamaica who intermarried with the local Mosquito Indians, creating a mixed race population distinct from the Spanish Creole populations found in the centre and the West Coast. And so uh, it says the Mosquito Coast remains predominantly Anglican and Moravian, while the Spanish-speaking portion is predominantly Roman Catholic. Um, the oldest extent, extant Anglican church is the Bluefields, built in 1896, and the diocese operates a number of schools and social service institutions in the region. So this is the the issue here. It was under the Church of England, but it, it joined, um, uh, left in 1998. Um, but it's not just uh, the churches that are being closed down and the assets seized. It's, it's all these other things as well. The schools, the social service institutions that they've opened are being taken by the government. This is like absolutely huge here. How can a government close down a church and churches and independent churches and other organisations which they deem just that they just do not want? And how does the church survive? Uh, well, it will survive. Of course it will survive. The church will prevail. Um, but it's the good work that's helping it as well. Obviously, in a country where the, things are being closed down, things are under control by the government and the president, and, and help is needed for those poorest and most in need. And so, you know, that, again, uh, we need the church worldwide uh, denouncing this. Uh, solidarity, Christian Solidarity Worldwide, head of agriculture, uh, advocacy says uh, has denounced the government move the arbitrary cancellation of historic and diverse religious associations is in many cases leaving their members with nowhere to gather for religious purposes but they are not the only people who will be affected we are highly concerned about the impact on the thousands of children and adults who interact with the schools and other institutions like hospitals run by these organisations many, the, many of the affected associations form a key part of the social fabric and culture of their localities we continue to stand in solidarity with those who have dedicated their lives to the improvement of their communities, only to see it arbitrarily taken away by a totalitarian government interested in its own survival. And I think one of the huge issues with this government being mismanaged for the country is they're running out of money. <laughs> Where do you go for money? You just shut down all these places and you take their money and you sell their assets. And it's huge and it would cost um so much for those people who are most in need and uh, it needs to be strongly rebuked by the christian church and uh, it needs a lot of prayer a, a lot of prayer 
but to mix up sad stories like that with good stories there's a few on here now about uh, celebrities and, and celebrities you have in the faith or coming to faith so adam pt the olympic swimmer and holly ramsey gordon ramsey the chef's daughter got engaged congratulations that, that's a good thing what, what's beautiful about this we know adam pt is a christian overtly christian and, and his faith helped him through his troubles um has shared in their announcement um bible verses and so uh, on instagram so they uh, they put um matthew 19 6 so they are no longer two but one flesh therefore what god has joined together and let low and separate uh, in their announcement and it and it points to god and it puts faith and it's great now after so long that christians uh have been limited on how they not that they are limited but how tv cuts interviews if you see if you go online and you look at celebrities praising god after interviews especially sports uh scenarios the the camera cuts or the sound goes or whatever happens they go to another interview that through these independent media they can uh, announce things and say things and then start praising god and pointed to god so it is um it is beautiful and so holly ramsey uh says uh 1 corinthians 13 13 and now these things three things remain faith hope and love but the greatest of these is love classic uh wedding um verses uh that would be uh or verse that's used there so it, it's great now that christians are out there and they can be confident uh and that will reach many non-christians in fact <laughs> you could say that uh this engagement has has done more in in a, a couple of tweets by two people celebrating their engage the engagement with verses to god than peterborough cathedrals uh ibiza classics night so you could say but moving on uh football star raheem sterling gets baptized and so you see raheem sterling who now is on loan to chelsea or arsenal from chelsea should have gone to Aston Villa. Should have gone to Aston Villa. Um, but he's got uh, baptised. Put that online as well. And I think, you know, I've seen him when he scores goals. Uh, but please don't score against Aston Villa if you do play us. Um, cr- cross himself or, or point to God. And so he's 29, committed his life to Christ uh, in his uh, in his church. He got baptised Uh and, and again, put that out on, looks like, Instagram or, or Twitter. X, X for the newer people. Um, he shared his testimony to those present and said that from a young age he'd wanted to make enough money to look after his family. And, th- and so this is the interesting thing. He's, he's found it wanting fame and fortune. He says, I've always, ch- uh, I've always had a dream to get my mum and my family out of a certain predicament. Absolutely right. And I always chase that dream. But along the line, like anything, you create, you're creating habits. You're creating an ego, chasing what I believe I wanted, which is not really what I wanted. As I'm growing and maturing, I can see that I was chasing my ego. Amazing. Um, that revelation. I was seeing I was chasing what is really not for me. I was going after it. I was going into different environments, shoots. I was doing certain, um, I was going to certain places and doing certain things. And I was coming to the realisation that I don't believe this is what I want. I don't believe this is truly who I am. And isn't that amazing? And, and uh, you know, I'm sure he's got a church, good church around him, but what, what a testament, what a, a, a faith to get out there. Again, will this get into mainstream? It won't. But this is this is what we, we should talk about, you know, and, and get that out there. It's not about the celebrity culture, but he's well known. And he's coming to Christ. And what a testimony. He's got everything. He's got everything. And he's realising. I'm going here, I'm going there, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And it's creating an ego in me. And, and that that's not good. It's not good. And, and in a world where very much at the moment is about the self. About the self. Um, it is great that uh, someone um, so famous plays for England plays for big teams um, has come out and said I got baptised I was getting it wrong and Jesus is the way there's another story uh, and these are all from Christian Premier News um, is this song released by Coldplay uh, with other people in there 
called We Pray, it dropped uh, 23rd of August, and it's got rappers Little Sims, Nigeria singer Burner Boy, Palestinian Chilean musician, uh, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, Eliana, I think that's right, and Argentina singer Tinny. Um, we, many people know Chris Martin grew up in the church, uh, and as the article says, has written songs um, infused with biblical imagery, but has... Um, talk negatively about the church uh, and how it grew up but this uh this song i don't know if it's fully written by him uh, or in conjunction with the others it appears uh, the article says and i would agree um to articulate a deeper spiritual hunger with lyrics such as i pray that i don't give up pray that i do my best and so we pray for someone to come and show me the way uh, so it is um it is interesting. I have listened to the song. Um, it does sound Christian or a Christian influence. It does sound uh, that they are perhaps praying to God or, or, or the songs about that. Um, there are other occasions that it, it doesn't. Um, but what's important, and, and again, through this move, through these celebrities and people coming to faith, and we'll get onto one in a minute, Russell Brand, uh, is that um, is Chris Martin coming back to his roots? Or, or all these people are now realizing, uh, like Raheem Sterling, that what they've got is really not what they wanted and, and it's never really satisfying them. And um, now, and this is the way that they're investigating, you know, because that's the other thing, we shouldn't slam the song. Um, you know, it's a process. We all go through that process and come into faith. We investigate, we, you know, we do it different ways. And, and he's a creative guy. Maybe this is one of the ways that he's working this uh, out, that he comes back to the truth. So uh, I would say on this one, I take it, perhaps he's on a journey here. And I don't know, whether, I don't know the other people, uh, but perhaps they are. Maybe they're Christian, maybe they're not. But, you know, but we also... Just hold them in our prayers. They hold them in the prayers. That if they are the journey, that they get the right people around them, and that they come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Um, and again, uh, here's another one. Uh, but yeah, he's always been Christian. Lenny Kravitz um, at the which awards MTV Music Awards. <laughs> they're still going um, during the ceremony. Announced uh, because his mother has just died of cancer. Uh, well, his mother died. Um, of cancer in 95, 95 age 66 um, dedicated to her he said wow this is incredible I'm so grateful 31 years ago my mother was with me at an award show uh, was the VMA so I dedicated this to her he, he stated I thank God for this journey this incredible journey I thank Jesus for life um, let me just get that right I, I don't want to say when she died in a pre-show interview Lenny dedicated the win to his mother, Roxy Rocker, who died of cancer in 1995, age 66. Sorry, I just wanted to fact check myself. Uh, just reading that uh, he was at an award show and I was just like, I hope that was a, a, few, a year ago and then I said that she died so long ago. But again, um, on stage, uh, recognise his mum, absolutely, even though it died so long ago and I, I get that. My dad died uh, back in 1991 and my mum in 2009, you know, and... Uh, if I was in that situation, you know, they brought me into life. They nurtured me. They they received the credit. Um, but um, what he's saying here is is I thank God for this journey, this incredible journey. I thank Jesus for life. You, you know, say that he doesn't say I thank Jesus for my life. He's saying I thank Jesus for life. You know, there's um, a, a bigger thing there, a, a deeper understanding, and perhaps or maybe just admit the word, but. Um, Again, another celebrity who's out there giving praise to Jesus. And, and I, I hope this tide is turning. I hope this tide is turning. And I hope that these stories, instead of being in Christian Premier News, get into the mainstream media and they, they start reporting this phenomenon that's going on. But I think Lenny Kravitz has been a Christian for a long time. Which brings me on to Russell Brand. Uh, Russell Brand was at an event in the States uh, with Tucker Carson doing an interview because I saw the the the, uh, the prayer that he did on 
X, X, not Twitter. Well, you're allowed to still call it Twitter. I don't know. It's easier to call it Twitter. It sounds weird calling it X. Um, and Tucker Carlson asked him to pray. And what was interesting about this as well, he, he got on his knees, he got off the chair. He was sitting, look, sitting, he was seated cross-legged on the chair, to be honest. But he got on his knees and he prayed. And I was like, okay, let's let's hear this prayer. And he said, um, I call on the name of Lord Jesus, our Heavenly Saviour. Lord, I humbly ask in, uh, in this congregation, in Phoenix, Arizona, with my host Tucker Carson, in indifference to him, but in ultimate difference to you, our Lord and Saviour, uh, to whom we are all your younger siblings and your children. And he went on, I pray in your name that the forthcoming election uh, be an opportunity for unity for America and for Americans, for forgiveness and grace, that the dark and dynamic forces that appear to operate at the level of the state the deep state of the corporate and global world experience your light lord and that's like a you know that's an off-the-cuff prayer and that's a real uh deep prayer as it were for a, a new christian and it's great that he um prayed uh, and so publicly so was it the elephant in the room uh let's just acknowledge that he is being investigated for sexual offenses misconduct um but we have to wait. Uh, it's innocent until proven guilty. Uh, whether those things happened uh, in the past. He's married now with children. Um, I've seen online and by Christians, uh, people condemning him like he's guilty already. Look, you know, we do not know that yet. The police are still investigating. We have to wait and see. But through this, through what's happened... And through his life, he is an, also another one who's come. And it might be through uh, this investigation that he's come to know Jesus. Um, and whether he, he turns out guilty or not, and if he's guilty, he's got to face the consequences of that. If he's not, then uh, then it has been investigated. And I, I, I hope that he can get over that. I'm sure it's a trauma. Uh, but he has come to know Jesus. And, that, and, and if he's... Or, I say, if he, he's, he's given his life over to God and he's repented of all those wrong things that he's done. That's what we all do. We're not all perfect here. But I don't think uh, it's right that people go and um, speak of him as guilty and say, Look, you, you shouldn't follow him. You shouldn't follow him because he's guilty of the stuff before we know anything. And um, But we should praise God that uh, people like Russell Brand, who have got a huge following, is openly talking about god um on that and we will wait to see what the police investigation says and and then his response to that as a christian uh, whichever way it goes it will be very interesting but it is but what i liked on this was that he got off his chair he knelt on the floor and he prayed a, a real prayer uh and he talked about the demonic forces yeah he, he talked about the deep state and all that but that's uh a part of uh, what he looks into as well so i'm not surprised so here's the so we go good bad good <laughs> then we're back onto the bad um but this this needs to happen as well uh pastors uh vicars falling you know they're not all perfect people and uh, there needs to be uh, more scrutiny and getting the right people in and, and, and checking them and checking up on them but a celebrity pastor arrested for sex crimes within weeks of a long man hunt over in the philippines but this guy uh, led a huge church um and this the, this is huge right um the past is all also on the fbi's most wanted list in the united states for separate sex offenses and tra uh, sorry separate sex uh, start again for separate charges of sex trafficking and bulk smug cash smuggling uh, which he's denied any wrongdoing so when they went to arrest him, over 2,000 police were deployed since last month to find to search a sprawling area to find him. And um, it's quite amazing. So he, he built up a huge follow, a huge church in the Philippines. Um, but so you're going out there Sundays. Uh, you're going out there. Uh, preaching his gospel the gospel you can't really call yourself a christian if you're doing this so it's like a front um this is like a cult actually just reading the second paragraph i'll get onto that in a sec um and then sex trafficking of 
I wouldn't like to think women and children, perhaps. In men. It says, Apollo Quilbolo, self-proclaimed owner of the universe and appointed son of God, who <laughs> sounds delusional, is wanted on char sex charges. Ugh. See, look. Is wanted on char charges as child and sexual abuse and re related allegations of human trafficking. He's denied anything wrong. Um, but they went after him. Um, and they found him. He was transported with four other co-accused uh, to the capital. And um, he should rightly be tried. Uh, maybe what I should say is, um, what I said with Russell Brand, innocent until proven guilty. And I should listen to myself. Um, but uh, it doesn't sound good. It says Qu Quibolo is followed by millions of people in the Philippines. Why? You know, it's like the, how the devil works, right? How the devil works to raise up these people, say that the head of a church, represent Jesus Christ, gain millions of followers in the Philippines, and on the side, allegedly uh, trafficking children and women and, and uh, uh, sexual abuse himself. Um, it's like, of course we're going to expect it. But it needs to be weeded out, absolutely. And I'm glad that they arrested him. And I'm glad that he's going to go into the trial. Which they will find him either guilty or not guilty. Close at home. Former church minister jailed for defrauding congregation. So this is in uh, Dunmurray in Belfast. Uh, he, a 50-year-old minister, he was jailed for six months for defrauding the church of £10,000 and a grieving widow of £1,000. This guy was found guilty. So this guy's guilty, we know. Uh, he's from St. Colmas Church uh, of Ireland in Dunmurray. Um, and he was previously found guilty of defrauding them of £10,000. So there was the classic organ that needed to be fixed. And um, he stole £10,000 from that fund, put it in his own bank account. And then even worse... Um, in 2016, he was he defrauded a widow of a parishioner uh, of a thousand pounds check, given for replacement organ following a church fire, and gifted him in the check. He said, "Don't but don't sign it to anyone. I'll do that," and then stole the money. What a horrible thing! Horrible, like stealing money from the church anyway is awful ten thousand pounds from a church awful stealing money from a parishioner's widow gave a thousand pounds to uh to help replace an organ after a fire you know what person is this question christian um awful awful and 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 yet there are still people like this in the church today um this they have to be found out and they have to be got out of the church straight away and they have to be prosecuted um, and let the law deal with them so that is Rev Dandrana this week we will finish in prayer not like I said not much going on but once you dig in there's some interesting things happening out there God, God is moving um, you know people coming to faith and and people getting caught and but you know the church is also being persecuted so the devil's moving against us as well and we need to pray for that so let's pray heavenly father we do pray for um our church the church of england especially for this process of the appointment of bishops the lord we, we pray that uh you you make the right thing happen pray for the church um in nicaragua pray for those people who attend the church and we pray for all those who use church services how they help in the community how they now have lost those and we pray we pray for charities and organizations to be able to help there pray for our cathedrals lord um lord that they just get back to preaching the gospel and serving people and being there doing the right thing for the for your glory and your mission pray for these celebrities come to know you and proclaim it online and we thank you for that um may it challenge people who see those posts may they come 
uh, to want to know you more. And we pray, Lord, for these people who come into the church to commit horrible things. We pray that uh, they are exposed and that uh, they are dealt with uh, rightly by the law. Amen. So that's Rev Dan's Roundup. Thank you for joining me. I'll see you again next week. Have a great week. Bye.